Hey guys, my name is Randall Hunt. I am a developer evangelist over at Amazon Web Services. We are, of course, hiring, blah, 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 lots of stuff like that. Uh, I am very, very passionate about Git. I think it's one of the coolest pieces of technology that we work with in our day-to-day -day workflows. And to that end, I've created a, a small talk to walk you through the things about Git that I think are very, very cool. This is somewhat of an intro-level talk, but at the same time, it has a lot of miscellaneous ideas and features that might be useful for people who are more familiar with Git. So we'll see what you guys like. I also have, I'm talking into a camera and facing John, so I have no idea how many people there are and I'm not going to be able to do any audience participation or anything and I, I apologize for that. We can do Q&A from the chat room if you want. Q&A, all right. Well, I, I'm going to take the hat off for now so I can continue presenting without my head getting hot. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to ask the assembled room here, what is Git? Version control. Git is not revision control software. Git is a content addressable file system. Git is, is a content addressable file system that happens to have some version control features. So. As we go through the rest of this talk, I want you to keep that in mind. Git isn't just version control. It's not even version control as a first level citizen. It's, it's a file system with version control features. And I'm not trolling you, I promise. What is a file system? A file system is something that controls how data is stored and retrieved. And Git really just does that. It controls how data is stored and received. And it does this with a content addressable file system. And when I say content addressable file system, your probably eyes are glazing over and they're like, well, who the hell are you and why are you still talking to me? And uh, well, I'm this guy. Uh, I probably know more about Git than you, but I always like to check. So just in case, uh, one second here. Are any of you on this list? OK, well, I'm the next name down. Uh, so. All of these people know way more about Git than me, and probably all the people underneath me know way more about Git than me. But for the purposes of, the purposes of this talk, we'll just continue assuming I know the most. I work at AWS. I tweet at JR Hunt. Please do not wish me happy birthday. It is not my birthday. It will never be my birthday. It's just this ongoing joke. Uh, I wrote Git Shots with this really, really stupid plugin, and you don't need to look at it. Um, and I write really fantastic commit messages. I'm, I'm world famous for these commit messages. I like ginger ale. I have eight major patches that I've submitted to Git, and uh, all eight of those were rejected. So it's a, it's a pretty great background I have here. Um, and a lot of you at this point are asking, OK, well, what, what is this three-letter command that I keep hearing so much about? So Git is like magic. It's going to allow you to easily switch context between different uh, branches that you're working on, different code execution paths, things like this. And you have these role-based code lines where you can have developed a master branch or you can develop a development branch and you can have different people working on these simultaneously. So if you have bug fixes that need to go out live immediately, it's very easy to push those. Whereas if you have development features that are more long running, you can have those in their own branch where they're not going to be disturbed by constantly having to rebase and, and and merge all of these bug fixes into them. The feature-based workflow is very important, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but that really enables you to do some amazing stuff in Git. And the other really amazing thing is the ability to experiment easily. When you lower the cost of experimentation to virtually nothing, then your ability to innovate increases dramatically. And enabling that innovation in your code base and within your team is vital for having an agile workflow or having a a better development team that's able to adapt. The other very important part about Git is that it is distributed version control. If you worked with other systems in the past, things like CVS or SVN, those aren't distributed. You have a central repo that has the whole repo in its canonical form stored. Now, GitHub is a central repo for us, but the other thing to point out is that just because you check something out from GitHub doesn't mean somebody can't check out that same code from your laptop. 
So to demonstrate that, I have this picture. You know, I can check out, you, where it says server computer, just imagine it says GitHub. So I can check out from GitHub the entire database. And then somebody on computer B, if we're on a plane and we don't have access to the internet, can just create an ad hoc network with me and read straight from my computer. Or I can check out from another place on my file system. The Git protocol doesn't really care what network you're using. It just wants to be able to access the repo. There are all kinds of different organization features. You can have lieutenants who review things and then send them up to the dictator who approves it. This is somewhat how the Python model works, and even though they don't use Git, they still use distributed version control. Uh, this is how the Linux kernel works. Uh, and this is how many, many patches get approved and very large software projects operate, open source software projects. The typical workflow is you have your working directory, and then you git add the files that you are interested in committing and interested in putting into a commit. And you, when you run git add, the, these files, they go into something called the index, or more commonly referred to as the staging area. And the reason there's a staging area is because you don't always want to add everything that you've changed in a single commit. Sometimes your brain works faster than what other people are going to be able to consume. So you'll set things out into separate commits so that they're logically consumable by humans. Version control only really exists for humans. If we were computers, we'd have perfect memory and we wouldn't need any of this mess. So keep that in mind. The reason you're doing version control isn't for yourself. It's for other humans. And it's not for the computer, it's for other humans. So you have this working directory and you get add dash p files. And the dash p, by the way, is very, very important. Do not ever, and I, if, I, if I get nothing else across in this presentation, this is the one thing I want to get across. Do not ever type git add star under any circumstances or git add dot. Those are the most dangerous things you can ever do because recovering from that heinous error is very difficult. So if you have something that you want to add, you do git add dash p, which initiates an interactive patch mode. And that patch mode will ask you to stage interactively each part of the file that you've changed. So then it, we've, we've added these stages to the index, to the staging area, and now we want to actually commit these into the git database. So we do git commit dash m and then our message. Hala is not an appropriate commit message. You should write, there, there's a lot of different formats for commit messages. Every project has their own. Follow the project standard. The other thing that's very important, and I can't sort of be enthusiastic enough about this, Git saves you from yourself. Humans are stupid. We make tons of mistakes all the time. Git stops you from making those mistakes. So long as you commit early and commit often, you will be able to move back to any state of the code that you possibly had. Uh, so the life cycle, one more time before we move on, and I'm going to tell you how Git works and some cool stuff about Git is you have your unchecked files, you add those unchecked files. You have your unmodified files and you edit those. You add all of this in to the staging area. And then in order to get back to the unmodified state, you commit those files. And that is when everything is in the database, the Git database, and Git agrees that your working directory is clean. Uh, we're not going to do a demo just because time doesn't really permit it. So, we are going to do a demo? Yeah, why not? Okay. So, is my screen still visible? Okay. So I've created this git repo called test repo. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to run git init. And that's going to create an initial repo for me. Am I good? OK. That's going to create an initial repo for me. And you'll see that all that's been created here is this .git directory. Uh, very simple. It just has some hooks, some objects, and some refs. And I will explain more about that later. But now I need to create a file. So I'll say vim readme.md. I'll say hello world. And then I've created that file and I've closed it and now I'm just going to add that file. And then I will commit that file. And I'll write a detailed commit message that says added readme.md. 
and you'll see that's it. It's done. It works. Uh, and that's what Git does. So what actually happens when I do that, right? What actually happens when I commit something? So if we take a look at .git directory and we go and we look at objects, you'll see these three things that exist there. And if I go git hash object readme.md, you'll see that it starts with 2b. So I just want to say cat, I'll do git cat file uh, dot ob er, dot git objects and then 2b. Or not 2B. Uh, I guess that's not working. But instead, I don't know what shell are you using. this is ZSH, and this is my own theme from ZSH. It's called Ranman. If you download Oh My ZSH, you can get that theme. It's called Ranman. Um, so, what we're going to do instead of trying to cat the file manually is we will go into Python and we'll import zlib. So all of these blobs are zlib compressed blobs. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And I'm going to say f equals open. And you'll see this is the file, right? That blob that's been stored is the file. And the way that it's detailed is the first part of it says blob. The next part is the length of the content followed by a null byte. And then I have the actual content of the file, which is a hello world a hashtag in a new line. And that is all Git is. That's how Git works. It's just zlib compressed blobs, trees, and other objects. And I'll get back to my presentation now, which might make this a little bit clearer for you guys. Uh, but first of all, do your work in branches. Um, so back when I was talking about a content addressable file system, what exactly does that mean? I, I gave you a, a brief demo of what that means a second ago. But to understand what it really means, you have to take a look at what Git itself is doing under the hood. And when you understand this, it's going to enable you to move things around in Git and to make operations in Git make a lot more sense. Uh, you'll grasp at a fundamental level what's happening when you run these higher level commands and it will allow you to reason more about what you're doing. So here I have this C file which is the refs.c which is part of the git source tree. And If you go git hash object refc I get this sha1. What is a sha1? A sha1 is a hash and I will explain slightly more about that in a moment but a hash is essentially your address. The content that you have becomes the address by which you look up your content. It seems circular, doesn't it? So a SHA-1 is 160 bits of uh, unique address space. And I say unique because it's, it's mostly unique. You can generate collisions purposefully if you'd like, but the chances of a collision happening in real life are very, very slim. Uh, now we're going to go through the math for what a SHA-1 is. I hope you guys are ready for this. Okay, so, no, I, we're definitely not going to do that. I'm sorry. That's only one piece of it. The way you can think about a SHA-1 is this, right? You add data, you add more data, you mix it all around, and you get a magic number. Essentially, you have this uh, bucket into which you're pouring data, and then when you're done pouring in data, you say, okay, bucket, I'm done. And the, bucket gives you a magic number out. And if you do that exact same amount of data the next time and the exact same order of that data the next time, you'll get the same number out. So everything in Git is a SHA-1. Just keep that in mind. Every Git object that you know about is a SHA-1. So branches are references to commits. Commits are pointers to trees. Trees are pointers to trees and blobs. So let's go through that one more time because it's important. Branches point to commits, commits point to trees, and trees are pointers to other trees and blobs. And blobs are just zlib compressed files. So here's another example of that. You'll see the tree at the top is just the directory listing. Then you have the blobs, which are readme, refile, everything like that. And then you have another tree and another blob. So I heard you like 
directed acyclic graphs. So I put some directed acyclic graphs in your directed acyclic graphs. So a DAG is a directed acyclic graph. And if you're a computer science nerd like me, you're probably pretty interested in that, and I encourage you to go look it up. But I'm not going to talk any more about it right now. Uh, this is the code in Ruby that would allow you to, you know, roll your own Git. Basically, it would take the content of file and it would SHA-1 hash that and then put it into the Git database. I mean, this is very simple stuff that's very, very fast to do, even for larger files. And it's uh, the reason Git is such a different type of version control system than everything else that you've experienced. So a commit object, there, there are four object types. There's a uh, commit, there's a tree, there's a blob, and there's a tag. Ignore tags because tags are useless. Uh, but commits, trees, and blobs are all very much interrelated since commits point to trees. And a commit has another piece of metadata, which is a pointer to n number of parents. So uh, unlike humans, commits can have 10 parents, 20 parents, as many parents as you want, so long as it's a directed acyclic graph. Uh, the other thing that they have is the date, the author, and, and other metadata like that. Trees are pointed to by commits and have... A tree only is allowed to exist in Git. The, the defining feature is that every leaf node of the tree must be a blob, which is why if you've ever tried to commit an empty directory in Git, it doesn't exist. And then blobs are just zlib compressed files. And uh, the other thing that I should point out is all the commits, the trees, all of this is all zlib compressed. So zlib is a type of compression that uses run length encoding um, and Huffman codes for those of you guys who are total like algorithm nerds like me. Um, and it basically takes data that has common structures in it and reduces those structures into one character and only stores those long strings once rather than 50 times. Uh, and a lot of processors have instruction sets that will allow you to decompress those and compress those very, very quickly. Zlib has been around for a long time, so people are pretty smart about how you can move this stuff around. Uh, if you're interested in it, you can just Google Zlib and you'll, you'll get a lot of good information. The final thing to note is that Git is separated into two sets of commands. You have the porcelain. Uh, this is not a toilet, by the way, this is a metaphor. And then you have the, uh, the, the plumbing commands. So the porcelain commands are the things that you're used to using. Commit, branch, log, diff, add, etc. The plumbing commands are things that you probably don't ever see, which are hash object, cat file, list tree, and unpack and pack. Uh, these are the things that bind Git together. They bind the universe together. Plumbing keeps everything running, even if it's sometimes done with duct tape. Um, all of the commands that you're used to using in Git, which would be commit and things like that, these all rely on these underlying commands, these plumbing commands. So if you ever truly wanted to understand Git, you should check out the plumbing commands. And if you don't think that's cool, then I don't know what else to tell you. Because when I learned this and saw how beautifully designed it all was, this is my face when I finally learned all of this. So if you guys have questions, I have, you know, I, I get answers, but otherwise I just want to show you one last thing that you should do in your Git workflow, which is which is tig, which is an in curses, which is a, a command line front end for Git. So with Git log, You can go through and you can look through all of the commits with dash g. You can do a regex search. And I froze my computer, I'm sorry. But then I can pipe that into TIG, and TIG will give me a front end for browsing all of that information uh, without ever leaving a terminal. So I really suggest you check out TIG. Um, and that's all. That's all I have to say. So the first question is, um... Why is git add star bad idea? What does extra do? So git add star will go through and it's relying on the shell, which everybody uses a different shell and you're not sure it's going to be the same behavior all the time. It's going to use the shell to add every file in that directory and every directory in that directory to your project. So if you're using a node project, for instance, and you do git add star, 
and you don't have it correctly set up without getting ignore it, what it's gonna do is it's gonna go in and add those node modules into your repo. So now when you push things over the network, every single person is having to grab those node modules every single time. And that's a lot of excess that's not needed because that same stuff is always available through NPM install or something like that. It's the same thing with Java and committing your build artifacts. And uh, the last question is, uh, what, uh, why, why should someone use Git rather than like a traditional like, version control like SVN or CBS? For the reasons that I stated in the beginning around distributed version control, there's a really funny anecdote told by BuzzFeed back during Hurricane Sandy. Their entire website went down uh, as the data center flooded. And they, the only reason they were able to bring back a working version of this, because their, their code repo was hosted in that same data center, is because they had recently switched from Subversion to Git. And so by using Git, every single person who was a developer had a recent copy of the data, had a recent copy of the working code. And they were able to push and pull from each other rather than having to rely on some central repo. That's just one of the benefits of Git. The other benefits are performance and easy experimentation. SVN doesn't enable these things. Awesome. Uh, any other final thoughts there? Uh, I hope you guys check out Git. And if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email, uh, randhunt at Amazon.